Go ahead. Okay, so let us go ahead and get started while um, some folks are still getting their lunch. So today is the second part in our two-part uh, series on assessment of the right ventricle and right-sided valves. Last week, Dr. Naga talked about the echocardiographic role. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about CMR, uh, how it's utilized to assess the right ventricle and the right side of valves. So here's the outline of my talk. And I think one of the things that, you know, for the fellows you'll notice is that if you look back at any lecture series 10 or 20 years ago, there's very little talk on the right ventricle. And I think we're beginning to see much more of a focus on the right ventricle and the right side of heart valves. I'm gonna go through some of the background, talk about the pathophysiology of right ventricular dysfunction, um, <clears throat> talk about how CMR uh, approaches assessment of the right ventricle, and then also talk about how uh, it approaches assessment of the tricuspid valve. Um, and I specifically left out the pulmonic valve because Dr. Uh, Duarte in her talk, talks on imaging of adult congenital heart disease will touch on uh, pulmonic regurgitation, which is uh, commonly seen in the pediatric or the adult congenital populations. So to start off with, I think it's important to recognize that, well, let me ask this question. I mean, generally speaking, the amount, the stroke volume of the right ventricle should equal the stroke volume of the left ventricle, right? Uh, if it doesn't, there's a problem, right? Uh, that says that there's some volume overload state that's going on. Um, but the RV tends to be a larger size chamber than the left ventricle, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15% larger in size. And as a result, if they're both effectively pumping out the same stroke volume, then the RV ejection fraction is going to be a little bit lower than the LV ejection fraction. So I think it's important to recognize that if you look at the workload of the right ventricle, it's a much lower workload. It's about 25% of the stroke workload of the left ventricle. And the reason because the RV is pumping against a low pressure system. The pulmonary artery pressures generally should not be anywhere near your aortic pressures. And so as a result, the RV has lesser work that it has to do. As a result, there's less muscle. There's less myocardium there. So the RV wall is typically about three to five millimeters thick compared to the LV wall which is on the order of eight to, to 10 or 11 millimeters in, in thickness. And the RV also tends to be much more compliant. Now, uh, just for a nomenclature standpoint, uh, here I'm showing you a three chamber view. So this is an MRI scan in a patient uh, showing you what's called an RV three chamber view. So what are the three chambers that we see here in this RV three chamber view? One of the, the fellows want to tell me. Right, so right here we're seeing the right atrium, the tricuspid valve. What is this structure right here? What's that? Yeah, that's a superior vena cava, absolutely. We're seeing the right ventricle, and then here the right ventricular outflow tract and the pulmonary artery. And so blood flow here, um, and this is you know beyond this talk, but if you look at the pattern of blood flow in the right ventricle, it can be rather interesting in the sense that there's some blood flow that actually uh, comes straight in uh, and goes straight out to the pulmonary artery all within one cycle. Whereas there's other blood flow that comes in and recirculates around down in the ventricle or in the apex itself. Um, but again, that's, that's for another discussion. Uh, but I think just to recognize that the RV is different than the LV. So although we tend to think of things analogous between the LV and the RV, they're really quite different structures. This is um, uh, showing you actually the fiber orientation of the right ventricle. And I think Dr. Naga probably uh, touched on this uh, last week, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Just a couple of key highlights. Obviously, between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, there's some shared uh, fibers. There's some shared tissue, and that's the interventricular septum, right? Because essentially, that septum, you can think of it as a part of the LV as well as a part of the RV. There are these uh, mutually encircling epicardial fibers that occur that encircle both the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And then I think also important to keep in mind is that the attachment of the RV, RV free wall to the anterior and posterior wall. So you can see this right here. The RV free wall attaches to the, the anterior RV wall attaches to the septum, 
and the inferior artery wall here also attaches to the septum. And so oftentimes this is an area where you can have myocardial fibers that are going at slightly different angles between the left ventricular fibers and the right ventricular fibers as they insert in. So uh, the other important thing I think to keep in mind is that both the septum and the RV, RV free wall uh, contribute approximately equally to right ventricular function. So you really need to think about RV function as really coming from multiple different, uh, or RV contractility coming from multiple different areas. Another important thing to think about is that there's longitudinal shortening that happens, just like we see in the left ventricle, but actually it can be more pronounced actually in the right ventricle. And in fact, longitudinal shortening is a greater contribu contributor to the RV stroke volume than the short axis or the circumferential shortening uh, is. And you can see this in this example here. If you look at the amount of base to apex descent or longitudinal motion uh, in the left ventricle and the mitral valve, compare that to the, the right ventricle and the tricuspid annulus, you can see there's much more longitudinal motion for the right ventricle than there is for the left ventricle. Now what about the blood supply for the right ventricle? And if we talk about for the septum itself, uh, I think most of you remember from your uh, cath lab days or your med school days, that the, the septum itself, the interventricular septum, is supplied by both the LAD and the RCA, with about the anterior two-thirds supplied by the LAD, and the inferior one-third of the septum supplied by the RCA. Um, and then obviously the RV free wall here is generally supplied by acute marginal branches. Okay, um, there's also a, uh, a differential response of the RV and the LV to increases in afterload. Uh, and I think Dr. Naga went into this uh, quite extensively during his talk. Uh, I think that the, the main point here is that the RV may demonstrate a heightened sensitivity uh, to afterload changes compared to the left ventricle. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the pathophysiology of right ventricular dysfunction. And really, there's a long list of different conditions that can lead to RV dysfunction, uh, as I've shown here. And I'm not going to go into all of the individual specifics because they're, they're beyond the, the, you know, the, uh, this talk. But I think you can kind of break it down into conditions that lead to either pressure or volume overload, conditions that lead to some intrinsic myocardial problem, and that can be either some myocardial tissue abnormality or uh, ischemia or infarction, which then leads to myocardial tissue abnormality, and then obviously congenital heart disease, and then kind of structural impairment if you have something like pericardial disease, which prevents the right ventricle for, from uh, expanding. Um, and generally what we see commonly in clinical practice when you talk about pressure overload uh, on the right ventricle, the most common cause is actually pressure overload from the left ventricle. So some decompensation of the LV that leads to an increase in backward pressure uh, through the pulmonary artery uh, circuit that then leads to increased afterload of the RV and then ultimately to RV failure. But there's also uh, pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary thromboembolic disease that can do that. There's right ventricular obstruction um, and then some congenital conditions as well. From volume overload standpoint, the most common one that we're gonna see is tricuspid regurgitation uh, and pulmonic regurgitation. So again, valve lesions, just like on the left side, they can also occur on the right side, as well as things like intercardiac shunts, which also lead to an excess amount of flow in the right ventricle. In general, the RV is better able to adapt to volume overload than it is to pressure overload. And then this is now just showing a relationship between the uh, RV ejection fraction and RV wall stress. And so again, the, the, the lowest wall stress is when you have higher RV ejection fraction. As the RV ejection fraction drops, you begin to have a progressive increase in RV wall stress. And another important thing to, to keep in mind is that although we think of the LV and RV as separate chambers, they're very interrelated. Obviously, they share the septum. And as a result, if you have RV enlargement, um, that will then lead to flattening of the septum that then essentially leads to compression of the left ventricle. And so oftentimes the, the clinical symptoms that you have in patients with uh, RV dysfunction, um, you know, aside from the kind of volume overload uh, in the abdomen and the legs, uh, is they can oftentimes have uh, loss of energy or fatigue. And that's, that's frequently due to low flow or low output because as the LV uh, or as the RV um, expands, it inhibits the ability of the left ventricle to fill, uh, 
and it, it can result in a significant reduction in uh, systemic uh, cardiac output. In addition to that, this uh, septal interaction can also lead to an increase in left ventricular pressures, uh, which can then also ultimately be back transmitted to the atrium and the pulmonary vascular system. And that may explain why some of these patients can also get dyspnea symptoms as well. Okay, so let's, let's uh, let me skip forward here. Let's get now to kind of the purpose for this talk after going through some of the background, which is really how is it that by MRI, uh, we try to assess the right ventricle. Um, and then we'll touch on also the tricuspid valve. So first off, when would you think about doing an MRI? So obviously, I think, you know, the, the you know, all the, the ACC-HA valve guidelines, or ACC-HA guidelines in general, talk about the fact that if you have suboptimal echo windows, uh, or difficulty in visualizing the endocardial borders, that's an indication for proceeding on from echocardiography to cardiac MRI. Now, for those of you that do echo, you know that the right ventricle is oftentimes more difficult, more challenging to image by echocardiography just to get adequate visualization. And then also couple that with the fact that the shape of the right ventricle is not a nice circular shape like you see with the LV, but rather more of a triangular or pancake shape. Uh, you know, I think you'll see that the, the right ventricle is one area where MRI really shines in being able to uh, provide uh, assessment. Now, I touched on this uh, before, that the shape of the right ventricle is not just a plain circle, it's, it's actually a crescent shape, um, and as a result, it can be hard to image the entire right ventricle within any one single uh, plane to get a good assessment. Um, and there's a challenge then if you're doing a single 2D plane and trying to make geometric assumptions uh, because the geometry of the right ventricle is, is very different than the left ventricle, and then couple that with the fact that the geometry of the RV can be variable from patient to patient as well. Um, so one of the things ideally for assessing the right ventricle is you want to utilize techniques that minimize the need for geometric assumptions. The other thing also to keep in mind is you know, the, the kind of the classic view that we use to look at the right ventricle is the four-chamber view. Uh, it, important to keep in mind that the, because of the shape of the right ventricle, uh, this triangular shape that you see on the short axis view, depending upon where you have your four-chamber cham angulation, the size of the RV on your long axis view can be variable. So I show you three example uh, cuts that are all going through the center of the left ventricle, but just depending upon the angulation, you can have a significant difference in the size of the right ventricle. Um, and again, this speaks to the importance in the echo literature of doing a specific RV focus view. Uh, one of the things that, you know, for the MRI technologist to recognize by convention, the view that we utilize to do a four chamber view is supposed to be the view that gives you the maximum opening of the right ventricle. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you have a properly uh, aligned view in which to do your assessment and then in addition to that, with MRI, we're not going to just do a series of long axis views, but actually we're going to do a series of short axis views as well. Now, so here's uh, some of the uh, feature, unique features of MRI. I think one is you get a very large field of view, so you can image the entire chest. Um, and you have the ability to pick imaging planes that you want. You're not uh, limited by rib space or uh, other abnormalities. So physically, if you can physically get the patient into the scanner, you can prescribe any imaging plane that you want. Um, and then obviously, where the real strength is, is, is in doing serial tomographic, oh, whoops, let's get rid of this here, sorry. Uh, tomographic images, where uh, you have a series of short axis views uh, all the way through from base to, to apex. So I'm showing you some example cases. Here's a normal RV. The patient on the left-hand side here is one who has severe right ventricular dysfunction. You can see very, very diminished RV contractility. And then the patient on the right-hand side here has a severe RV dilatation or enlargement. Uh, here now is a patient who has uh, significant RV pressure overload. And you can see increase in wall thickness within the RV free wall. Here we're measuring almost about 8 to 9 millimeters in wall thickness. Uh, which is clearly beyond uh, what the normal range is for the right ventricle, which again, as I talked about earlier, is about three to five millimeters in thickness. A couple of the views that, that I talked about, you know, one of the key views for assessing the right ventricle, in addition to the standard four chamber view, is this RV three chamber, or what we call the RV inflow outflow view. Uh, 
And this is just showing you actually how this view can be prescribed. Um, and so the key is that you want to be almost vertical or a little bit uh, uh, to the rightward axis uh, off of a short axis view. Uh, and you want to try to get close to the apex of the right ventricle and make sure you bisect the midpoint of the tricuspid uh, valve or the tricuspid annulus. And then as we touched on in this view, you get really the right atrium, the right ventricle, the right ventricle outflow tract, as well as the pulmonary artery. Uh, and then frequently in this view, you'll also be able to see the superior vena cava insertion into the right atrium. There's a second uh, uh, long axis view that we generally are gonna also prescribe uh, when we're doing a CMR scan. And, and this is a view that's called the right ventricular outflow tract view. And so this is generally done off of that three chamber view, but now you're trying to bisect the RVOT or the pulmonary uh, annulus, uh, both off of the three chamber view and then you also want to line it off of some axial views. So this allows you to get now an orthogonal view to the RVOT and the uh, pulmonic valve. And this shows you typically the base or the, the main part of the pulmonary artery. Now, from a uh, RV uh, uh, size and function standpoint, the approach that we're going to utilize is very similar to what you do for the left ventricle, which is you do a series of short axis views from base to apex. These are typically uh, every six to 10 meters apart. Um, and then instead of just relying on one single view, you actually just go through and summate all of these individual uh, short axis slices together. And again, as we know from the Simpsons rule of disc, the true Simpsons rule, if you take the area times the thickness of each slice, that gives you the volume for each slice and you just simply add these two together. Obviously we have post-processing software that does all of that for you but it then gives you a RV end diastolic volume, RV end systolic volume, and an RV ejection fraction. Now one of the things to keep in mind, because the shape of the RV is different than the LV, plus also the RV has a lot more trabeculations, so identifying the exact endocardial border um, is a little bit more difficult or more tricky than the left ventricle. And as a result, there's a little bit greater variability when it comes to RV volumetric measures or RV ejection fraction measures. Um, and so compared to the LV, where your uh, variability in ejection fraction is typically about 3 to 5%, for the RV, it's a little bit higher. Uh, and reported literature is anywhere from about 6 to 9% uh, variability in RV ejection fraction. Um, I think where you would use this, obviously, is in a case where you want to get an assessment of either global or regional RV function, or in cases where you want to look for serial changes. So you want to look for a change in RV ejection fraction or a change in RV volumes over time, whether it's uh, in the setting of underlying right-sided valve disease, whether it's in the setting of some uh, newer therapeutic intervention, uh, whatever the specific purpose, if you want serial assessment, then MRI, I think, has um, superior or, or has fairly good reproducibility and measurement uh, so that this is kind of the, the technique that's chosen uh, when you're trying to assess uh, serial changes. Now the other thing to keep in mind, just like with the LV, size is different between men and women. So this is actually summary data of uh, a series of normal healthy volunteers. Uh, this is from the European group. And what they found was that if you take the end diastolic volume and index it to normal, or I'm sorry, index it to their BSA in these normals, then the upper limits of normal for our ventricular, uh, right ventricular end diastolic volume is as high as 106 for men versus 92 for women. So again, smaller right ventricular uh, uh, cavity sizes for men versus women. Ejection fraction, though, was not different. So really, women tend to have smaller end diastolic as well as end systolic volumes. So the ejection fraction is not different between men and women, but the actual size of the, of the chamber is. And as a result, you'll see some of our recommendations for when, for example, uh, you meet criteria for RV dysplasia have different quantitative thresholds for men versus women. Uh, the other important thing to keep in mind is it changes with age also. Normal RV size is different for a 20-year-old than it is for a 75-year-old. And this uh, slide, I think, very nicely shows that progressive uh, difference which is if you look at this row right here, which is again the end diastolic volume to BSA, so the index RV end diastolic volume, in the patients in their 20s, the upper limits of normal can be as high as 114. Whereas if you go to men uh, in their 70s, the upper limit of normal is less than 100. 
And then obviously for women, the, the absolute values are lower, but there's this still, still the same relationship that with increasing deciles of age, the upper limits of normal RV size get smaller. And so one of the pitfalls you don't want to fall into, and that's why it's important to make sure before you say an RV is dilated, is that you really, really index it both to the patient's size, but also to their age. Because what you don't want to do is start calling a bunch of young, healthy, normal people with RV dysfunction or RV dilatation simply because they're young and their RV is big. Um, because again, that's just normal for young patients. The other question that often comes up, there's two different ways that you can actually do RV uh, uh, quantification. You can do it off of the standard short axis views like we have here on the right hand side, or you can do it off of a series of axial or four chamber views. And so I'm showing, so the, in this study here uh, out of uh, UVA many years ago, they actually went through and, and in a cohort of patients uh, imaged the RV with both orientations. So with a series of short axis orientations as well as a series of uh, axial orientations and then went through and uh, quantified the RV volumes. Um, and, and which method do you guys think, do you think they performed equal? Is one method better? Is, is one method worse? What do you think? Okay, that's a good, good guess to always say. They're fairly comparable, right? The, if you look at on the right-hand side, now ultimately the question is going to be, what do you use as your reference standard? So in this case, what they said is they said if there's a, these are normal, healthy volunteers, they use the pulmonary artery flow, which again, if in the absence of any regurgitation, uh, the RV stroke volume should equal your pulmonary artery flow, and they use that as kind of their reference standard. And what they found was that, uh, I don't know why, but the, um, the relationship was a little bit tighter for axial orientation, uh, but it was still reasonably good for, for doing it just off of the short axis orientation. The advantage, obviously, of doing it off of the short axis, which is what we do now in clinical practice, because we're already going to get a stack of short axis views to look at the left ventricle, and to quantify left ventricular parameters so you don't have to do additional imaging um, uh, versus doing a series of axial views where you now have to do additional imaging as well, which can be cumbersome. Okay, so let me go forward. So I think the take home message is really either approach is fine whether you do a series of short axis views or specific axial views to uh, assess the right ventricular uh, measures, uh, but recognize that, that we already get the short axis views on most studies and all the reference values that are published are all based on the short axis polymetry. So as a result, I think most labs will use the short axis views to report volumes and ejection fraction. Where we may supplement this with additional axial or, or long axis views, or, or like a stack of long axis views, is if we want to look for regional abnormalities in the right ventricle. And sometimes the long axis may be better for that. Now, we already talked before about the fact that there can be a significant amount of longitudinal motion um, in the right ventricle, more so even than the left ventricle. And so as a result, when you're doing your planimetry, it's going to be very important that um, you, you have slices that go all the way up through the base of the right ventricle. So for example, sometimes a common mistake that I see is technologists, they focus on getting short, a series of short axis slices starting at the base of the mitral valve or starting at the base of the left ventricle. When the RV dilates, it actually dilates along the lateral wall, the free wall of the RV, and it also oftentimes comes upward uh, uh, right next to the left atrium. And so the result, especially if you have a specific question about the right ventricle, you want to make sure that you have one or two uh, short axis slices that are a little bit more uh, atrial uh, in orientation. Let me now uh, see if I can show you guys a couple of example cases, and I want you to actually help me uh, to interpret this, these cases. Uh, so here, I'm showing you uh, a series, or, or an individual case, which is a series of short axis views. Can we get one of the fellows to help tell me what they see here? I'm looking at you, Salim, so you're on. Do we have a microphone? Can we get a microphone for him? And tell us how, I'm showing you the whole study here. I'll show you whatever, whatever view you want me to zoom in, I can zoom in for you. What I want you to tell me is how are you going to approach this? Is the microphone on? I don't. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay. Uh, 
short axis, the function at the LD looks fine. Uh, I don't see much of the LD hypertrophy. The RV looks definitely bigger in size compared to the LD. So there's RV enlargement. Okay, now stop right there. You said the RV is bigger than the LV, therefore mm -hmm. RV is enlarged. Is that, yeah. a, is that a correct I statement? I it's not a correct statement, but I usually compare the size. I mean, the LV, they look almost similar in size. Right, so, so, RV so think about it though, but what normally, a normal RV size is bigger than normal LV size. Normal RV size? Yeah, normally the RV is actually bigger than the LV, right? If you just look at volumes, right, the normal RV volume is higher than the LV volume, right? So, so again, part of this is the reason I actually picked on you because you haven't done MRI is to, you have to calibrate your eye when you're looking at MRI images. Because okay. you, 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 you've got now the in visualization of the entire right ventricle, and your, your eye, if you're used to looking at echo images, is going to think the RV is big. Okay, in this case, the RV is big. No, no so don't worry. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you can't use that rule. You can't use that rule of saying that the RV is bigger than the LV, right? That's an important thing okay. when you're looking at MRI images. Keep going. Yes, okay. sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So tell me what else you see. What else I see? <laughs> now I'm, I'm very careful about what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, the part, I mean, I want you to not just give me the answer, I want you to explain to me how you're coming up with it, right? Because part of it is understanding how you come up with the answer. What do you think about I mean, RV contractility? The function also of the contractility? RV seems, oh yeah, the, the function of the RV, it seems low. Okay. I don't see, it's not, especially the lateral wall is not coming in. The annulus kind of moving, the longitudinal function of the RV seems okay, but the, which is usually is the predominant function of the RV. It's more of a longitudinal uh, shortening, but the RV free wall is not yeah. coming in. Now, are you happy with the amount of longitudinal motion there is of the RV here? Mm. I mean, it's not, it's not robust, but it's moving. I mean, I haven't seen RV moving in the. Mo I mean, I've seen it, yeah. but I haven't focused. Yeah. So, so it's I mean, hard here to compare the the amount of longitudinal motion. I'm a little bit concerned about. And also, what do you think about just looking at these views here, the RV free wall? Okay. And you, you're concerned that it's dyskinetic, and by dyskinesis, do you define that as thinning of the wall during systole, yeah, so or do you define it as paradoxical movement? Okay, right. So, that, yeah, so a slight difference in terminology. I always like to use the term dyskinesis for when it actually is thinning. But I think clearly, especially if you look at this free wall area right mm -hmm. here, right? Let me see if I can click on this. It actually looks like it's not coming in, right? It actually looks like maybe even it's bulging out a little bit. Now, I'm going to make it really easy for you because I'm going to show you a view down here. Okay. What do you see here? I'm trying to, uh, and I'm going to start. I'm going to start kind of. We're going to make it really easy for Salim here. Okay, so that's the R. Okay, it's. it's yeah, it's a aneurysm, out. right? Yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's it's in diastole. There's a distortion in the shape, right? It's not just that it's bulging out, paradoxical. Even if you, if I pause this for you in diastole, even look, it's bulged out, right? Yeah. There's an RV aneurysm. Okay, mm -hmm. so Bing Bing Bing, what comes to your mind? ARVD, right? So uh, again, put this all in the context. I mean, you may never have looked at MRI images, but use your knowledge of cardiology and your knowledge of echo, and you're just, I mean, ultimately you're just looking at images of the heart, right? So now the question becomes, can I say he, this person's got ARVD? So we have specific diagnostic criteria, right? So that's the next step is, not only do you want to see the abnormalities, uh, you want to actually say what are the specific diagnostic criteria that we utilize. So there's a, a 2010 task force uh, that came up with diagnostic criteria for RV dysplasia. So they have criteria uh, based on echo quantitative measurements, and these are the MRI quantitative criteria. And basically, the first thing, and this I always tell people, don't get caught up with these numbers here first. First, you've got to have some abnormality of the RV, regional RV abnormality to begin with. Right, so it's either got to be RV akinesis, dyskinesis, or dyssynchronous contraction. And then you couple that with either RV dilatation or RV dysfunction. And the numbers is for men, more than 110 milliliters per meter square. 
or for women, more than 100 milliliters per meter square, and then, or an RB ejection fraction of less than 40. That then gives you a major criteria for RB dysplasia. And then here's a minor criteria, which are just a little bit less stringent. So a little bit less dilatation or a little bit less dysfunction than, than you need to get major criteria. Now, the other also thing important to keep in mind, if you go back and look at how you make a diagnosis of RV dysplasia, you need more than one major criteria, right? You need two major criteria, or one major plus multiple. So the point is, from imaging alone, you can't make the diagnosis of RV dysplasia, right? It provides you with diagnostic criteria, major or minor, but you still need to look at the EKG, the patient's history, multiple other things. Um, but obviously, this is a, a, a strikingly abnormal uh, study. And this person obviously went on, confirmed RB dysplasia with genetics as well, uh, and got a prophylactic ICD placement put in. Okay, because this patient was having a significant amount of PVCs. And this was an interesting case because, again, despite the PVCs that this patient's having, you can do arrhythmia rejection and other techniques so that the image quality still isn't significantly impaired. Okay, let me show you now another case, and I want somebody else to look at this one. RV looks enlarged for sure. What did you say? What? RV looks enlarged. RV looks enlarged. Okay. So, yes, we'll, we'll give you the numbers and all that, but yeah, this is definitely an enlarged RV, right? And it's not just that it's bigger than the LV, this is a big RV. Okay, what else? It's moderately depressed at least. Okay. Um, and so, if you were to come up with a visual ejection fraction? Um, for RV, like 30%, 20%. Okay. Yeah, probably 30%, 25 30% is probably reasonable, right? Because a big, boggy RV that's not contracting very well. What else? But, but again, the, the, you, may, you fell for the trap, which is always be systematic about it. Start, start with the LV first, uh -huh. right? Look at LV size, LV, LV wall thickness, LV function, LV and then come to the RV. LV wall thickness, uh, I'm not sure how to assess on MI, to be honest with you, but it looks okay. Okay. So, and obviously, I mean, you want to see a scale. So here's a scale on the right-hand side here. So these are two-centimeter markings here, okay? Um, so in, in this patient, the RV wall thickness, I mean, the LV wall thickness we got was about 10 millimeters, so normal, okay? And RV wall thickness, what do you think? It's thinned out. Okay, so it looks actually a little thinner, right? I mean, again, I, there's not a specific criteria to say what's RV thinning, um, but again, this is certainly not a thick RV. Uh, it looks a little bit on the thinner side. Now, go back to the LV again. What do you think about LV function? It's low normal. Okay, and do, is it kind of global? Or is there the any region? The apex moves more than the uh, base. The apex what? Moves more than the base, I think. The apex the, moves a little bit more than the base. Uh, the septum. Okay. Okay. So look at the short axis views. Just go through the short axis views one by one. Let me, let me do this. Let me click on this. Somebody looked at the LGE images, right? <laughs> yeah. It's always a, it's a, it's a quick cheat test to just scroll down. But don't do that yet. So just look at the thickening of the... Of, um, the lateral wall looks better than the septum. Okay. So I'm going to show you here, this is diastole, so you can look and measure what the thickness of the wall is. What do you think? Let me show you maybe one slice above this. Septal, inferoseptal especially doesn't look Okay. Come in. What about this, yeah, this kind of inferior wall right here, right? Mm -hmm. There's two things. I don't know how well it projects. Not only the, the thickening here is a little bit not as robust as the other areas, but also there's a slight increase in signal intensity here. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Uh, you might need a better quality monitor to see that. So, but, but this is where you can, I can make it easy for you. If, if I show you the delayed enhancement images, what do you see? There is uh, delayed enhancement in the inferior wall. Right, there's the inferior wall and it looks subendocardial based, right? So this looks like an infarct, right? So this person actually had an inferior wall infarct, an inferior STEMI, okay? Now, go back and look at the RV, and what do you think about now? You said the RV size is big, RV function is reduced. Is it globally reduced or regional? It's a re there's some regionality to us. Apex okay. moves more than the lateral walls, the other okay. base. Okay, so you think the apex is moving better than the lateral wall or the basal segment, right? Mm -hmm. And let me, look, let me show you this view right here, the short axis view. Yeah, the, uh, the lateral walls are not moving, or the inferior walls are not moving. Yeah, so exactly. So it's this kind of bottom half, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really the basal kind of diaphragmatic portion of the RV that's not contracting so well, right? And let me now show you, go back and look at that same delayed enhancement image, mm -hmm. and what do you see? The LG uptake 
in the inferior. Right. In this area where we saw the wall motion abnormality, there's actually infarct here as well. So this is a person who's got an uh, RCA, RCA infarct that caused an inferior STEMI, but again, it was likely a proximal RCA, so it knocked off the marginal branch, and you've got an associated RV infarct as well. Okay. So again, it, you know, we tend to focus on the LV, and, and this person probably was sent down to say, okay, I want to assess viability after an inferior infarct. Don't forget about the RV. Okay. Um, let me. Thank you, Smitha. Let me get back to my slides here. And then obviously one of the things that we know is that RV infarct is associated with the worst prognosis. So if somebody has a uh, infarct, uh, an RCA infarct, if they have associated RV infarct, their prognosis is, is not as good uh, as if they, have, if they don't have an associated RV infarct. Okay, so, so let's go now. So we talked a little bit about the RV itself. And again, I showed you a couple example cases the point of looking at the RV is every case where you have an interest in the LV, you need to make sure you look at the RV as well. Let's now focus specifically on the valves on the right side. And again, as I talked about before, Dr. Duarte is going to do a very nice talk on the pulmonic valve, which the adult congenital folks love to image, and they've been doing it for a long time. I'm going to focus a little bit on the tricuspid valve because, again, this is an area that we really haven't done that much of uh, in the past. And these were the ASE valve guidelines, which Dr. Zogby chaired, that came out about five years ago, um, which gave you some kind of echo quantitative criteria by which you can assess uh, tricuspid regurgitation. One of the things it pointed out was that the clinical experience with TR assessment, and this is really by echo as well as by MRI, was, less, was more limited uh, than there is for the mitral and aortic. And again, it gets to the concept, you know, we started with the left side, the left heart and left side of valves, and now we're, we've progressed on to assessing the right heart and the right side of valves. So a couple of things I think is important for us to recognize, what is the normal anatomy of the tricuspid valve? Um, so obviously it's simple as there's three leaflets, right? It's tri tricuspid. But tell me, somebody tell me, what is the normal uh, leaflet anatomy of the tricuspid valve? Was that? Yeah, so there's, there can be significant variance, right? And so the, the kind of standard nomenclature is that there's these three views, the anterior view, or I'm sorry, the anterior leaflet, the inferior leaflet, and then the septal leaflet. But the reality is, uh, and then also this is just showing you the tricuspid annulus, similar to the mitral annulus, has high points and low points, and, and this may come into to, uh, importance as we talk about mitral valve prolapse or tricuspid valve prolapse, um, this is just showing kind of the, the, if we were to do a specific view of the right ventricle, there's three kind of orientations that we would typically get, right? Just like how, you know, for the LV, you do three views, the two, three, and four chamber view. We essentially have kind of analogous uh, structure or uh, strategy for the right ventricle. And it's basically the four chamber view that we talked about before, which is showing you this right here. Uh, which is going to show you the septal leaflet. Now, depending upon the angle you have, right, because you notice the way the, the tricuspid leaflet, you can think of it as like a triangle. Depending upon what angle you have for this four chamber view, you could be imaging the anterior leaflet or you could be imaging the posterior leaflet. So there can be some diagnostic uncertainty, unless you have the, long, the short axis views that you can cross reference to check. Uh, the three chamber view that you get is typically done using this orientation right here, where it's almost going to kind of a straight vertical orientation. And this will go through the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. But again, depending upon your angulation, you could be hitting the anterior or the septal leaflet. And then uh, there's also this two-chamber view of the, the right ventricle that we can get. And again, does anybody want to tell me what this structure is right here, this little triangle shape? What is it? Yeah, this is a right atrial appendage, right? So you don't see that very often. Um, so this is on this two-chamber view, which is actually situated kind of like this view right here, where you're actually um, going through the anterior leaflet, but you may, depending upon your angulation, be going through the septal or the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So again, that's why it's always important to go back and cross-reference on your short axis view to see exactly where that particular uh, imaging plane was acquired. The other thing, and I think Issa touched on this, is that the anatomy of the tricuspid valve is even more variable than the anatomy of the mitral valve. And this is, um, you know, I always like to, you know, if I've got kind of extra time on my hands on a 
Saturday or Sunday evening, I like to go back and look at old pathology literature. So this is a, a study from the 1970s. I'm just kidding. I don't actually do that. Uh, this is a study from the 1970s in circulation where pathologists studied uh, 50 normal tricuspid valves and noticed you know, several things. Obviously, that's when they came up with this idea that there's three leaflets, but there's a lot of notches in the tricuspid valve. Uh, and some of these notches can be quite deep and almost look like there's an extra leaflet. And, and I think um, more recently, this concept has come into more uh, interest uh, with this very nice uh, paper by Becky Hahn using 3D echo, where she actually went through and kind of proposed a nomenclature for the tricuspid uh, anatomic variants. Right? And again, you've obviously got the three standard leaflets that we talk about, the septal, the anterior, and the posterior. But then you can sometimes have kind of a fusion of the anterior posterior leaflets. And then you can have some of these notches that, that we talked about before. Some of these notches can actually be quite deep. And as a result, for example, in this scenario right here, this type 3C, the septal leaflet actually has a notch through it. And so it almost, you can almost think of it as like there's two septal leaflets or two septal cusps. So again, I think keep in mind, the part of the reason why I think that the, the right heart and the tricuspid valve uh, is not as well understood is because the anatomy is very complex, right? And so I like to use this term, to tri the tricuspid valve complex is complex. All right, now let's talk about TR. So tricuspid regurgitation, what causes it? Well, there's primary TR and there's secondary TR. And if you look in the published literature, probably 90% of all the TR that's out there is secondary or functional. Okay, primary causes will be things like rheumatic, myxomatous, uh, Epstein's anomaly, which I think Dr. Duarte will touch on uh, in the uh, adult congenital, carcinoid, um, and a variety of other conditions. And then really secondary TR is due to not a problem with the leaflets themselves, but due to some other problem in the heart. And most common is due to left heart disease. So left heart valve disease, or left-sided cardiomyopathy, either systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction. But also, if you have pulmonary hypertension, that can then lead to increased afterload in the RV, and then that can then lead to tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and then there's some debates on whether you would call this, um, you know, I guess, you know, when, when you have a primary RV cardiomyopathic process or an RV infarct, Right, that's te technically still considered secondary TR in the sense that there's not a problem with the tricuspid leaflets themselves. Uh, so here's some examples of tricuspid pathology. I don't know if, how well this shows up on the screen or not. I've got this little asterisk here which shows you the coeptation zone of the tricuspid leaflets on a four chamber view. And you'll notice, I don't know if you can see it well there, that the jet actually originates more lateral than that. It's actually originating within the body of the jet, it's, or within the body of the leaflet itself. This is a patient who had endocarditis and has got a perforation, okay? Uh, here, uh, this is actually that same case. I think you can see it a little bit better in some of these other views where you can see the signal void, uh, or the flow acceleration that you see here is within the body of the tricuspid leaflet, not at the coeptation point. Okay, so let's, uh, here's another one. We don't see this that often. This is uh, kind of fixed, retracted tricuspid leaflets. This is carcinoid carcinoid heart disease causing obviously significant wide open tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, here's Epstein's anomaly where you can see um, the, the attachment of the septal leaflet is very apically displaced uh, along the septum here. Um, and again, there's some specific nuances to how you would do measurement of RV volumes and RV ejection fraction in this setting. And I'm sure those will be touched on in, in the congenital lectures. Um, so again, if, if we look at functional or secondary TR, and you break down kind of what is the etiology, about half of it's left-sided valve disease. Okay, so mitral uh, stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation. Uh, about a quarter is due to pulmonary hypertension. Uh, there's some variability in this number. I think in, in our practice here in the US, we probably see a higher percentage here uh, of LV dysfunction, so left-sided uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, there can be some cases of organic, uh, congenital tricuspid regurgitation, and then isolated TR, which I think now, which basically where there's not a primary problem with the leaflets, but you don't find another uh, cause of it. I think what we're learning now is a lot of these isolated are probably right heart or right atrial enlargement from AFib. So these may be atriogenic uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, 
Mechanistically, it's important to keep in mind there's two different abnormalities that can occur that lead to the development of tricuspid regurgitation. So kind of the classic secondary TR where you think of a problem with the right ventricle leads to distorted RV geometry, papillary muscle displacement, and then tethered tricuspid leaflets versus the other scenario, which is right atrial dilatation. Sometimes there's some dilatation of the basal right ventricle as well, and the tricuspid annulus is dilated also. And I've got kind of a nice schematic here which points this out. Let me see if I can make this play. So the left-hand side image is kind of the classic atriogenic tricuspid regurgitation, dilated annulus, flat leaflet co-optation. The right-hand side is an example of it due to the ventricle, and this is left-sided heart disease, which then has led to RV abnormalities, which then is leading to uh, tethering of the RV leaflets. Okay, so how do we quantify severity of regurgitation? And again, I'm sure you, if, you know, we've talked about this before when we talked about the mitral valve and the uretic valve. The way that we approach the tricuspid valve is very similar to the way you approach the mitral, right? And it goes back again to this principle of conservation of mass. It, the flow, in the absence of any shunt or any regurgitation, the flow in each chamber should be the same, right? So the flow coming that your RV is ejecting should be the same as the flow going out the pulmonary artery and the flow going out the left ventricle and the flow going out the aorta. Now, if I have a pulmonary artery flow, which is 80, but I, I'm getting an RV stroke volume of 150, then do I have tricuspid regurgitation? And how much? 80 versus 150? 70, 70 cc's, right? So um, just simply comparing the two, the flow across each chamber allows you to get an assessment. That's, that's the way you do TR assessment, really, just like you do for the mitral. Okay, so again, remember, if you remember the, the talk I gave uh, last fall, the pulmonary artery, the flow I measure across the pulmonary valve represents two components. What are those two components? Of the flow coming across the pulmonary artery or the pulmonary valve? It's your systemic flow and what else? And your pulmonic regurgitation, right? So it's the systemic flow plus the recirculating volume. Now my RV stroke volume has three components to it. What are those three components? Uh, yep. Yeah. RV stroke volume is conceptually what three components? Okay. So the pulmonic regurgitation because that recirculates back. Tricuspid regurgitation because that recirculates back. And the systemic flow. Right. So again, as long as you know that, ultimately, what you're measuring is either two or three components of flow. If you know that, then you can solve. For what the what the abnormality is, okay, and so in, in, this is exactly what we do for for quantifying tricuspid regurgitation, whether it's primary or secondary. Same approach, RV stroke volume is 110, PA flow I'm measuring here is 60. That tells me that that, that difference, 50 cc's, has got to be what's going backward. Obviously, in the absence of a ventricular septal defect with a right to left shunt, right, or left to right shunt. So, in the absence of any uh, intracardiac shunt, this approach works just fine. Um, and, and then, so this actually was applied uh, in, in a series of patients here a few years ago. We looked at patients with uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation, quantify the RV end diastolic and end systolic volume, the RV stroke volume, and then compared it to the PA flow. And from that, we're able to identify kind of increasing risk strata as you have more tricuspid regurgitation, right? So if you have the highest strata in this study here, we looked at those with 45 mLs of tricuspid regurgitation or a tricuspid regurgitant fraction of more than 50%. That means half of their RV stroke volume is going backward into the right atrium. These patients had a much higher risk of mortality. This was just looking at all-cause mortality. Suggest, and this was after adjustment for you know, clinical covariates as well as other imaging covariates, also adjusting for RV ejection fraction. And so again, you know, this along with uh, you know, the echo literature that's come out in the last several years, I think has gone from a question of whether tricuspid regurgitation, the, the prognostic effect of it is simply due to the underlying disease processes that cause it, or is tricuspid regurgitation independently associated with a worse outcome? And I think that the pendulum is swinging towards worse outcome independent due to tricuspid regurgitation. And these are just some Kaplan-Meier curves showing that as well. Now, the other question that comes in is, okay, so I've got TR and I've got um, what about the RV performance? 
Now, it's tricky when you look at the RV, just like remember with mitral regurgitation, the LV ejection fraction will be artificially elevated, right, when you have mitral regurg. And so for TR as well, the question is what level of, LV, of RV function is associated with the worst outcome? And so this study right here uh, looked at a series of patients that were going to surgery, so tricuspid valve surgery, and they followed these patients out over time after their tricuspid valve surgery for severe TR, and what they found is that those that had an RV ejection fraction of more than 46% did much better on follow-up than those with an RV ejection fraction of less than 46%. So this is a CMR study out of the Korea, uh, which looked at this. And then um, more recently, we've got some data here from, from our own site, uh, which Andrada presented this uh, at the SCMR, looking at kind of uh, medical ma patients that are going medically managed with moderate or severe functional tricuspid regurgitation, where again, the, the RV ejection for threshold that we found was 47%. So again, this now tells you that it's not just the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation that's gonna modulate prognosis, but that the amount of RV dysfunction or RV impairment can also have an impact as well. And so important to assess the TR severity but also to assess the right ventricular performance as well. These are actually just some of the guidelines that talk about when you would think about sending a patient on for tricuspid valve surgery. And one of the things that's also interesting, if you have you know, extra time on a Saturday or Sunday, look not just at the current guidelines, but look at the previous set and the previous set before that, because that shows you how the field is moving. And so I look back at the first set of guidelines when I became a fellow uh, from the ACCHA, and there were essentially no indications or very few indications for when to operate on a tricuspid valve. Uh, and you can see now the, the list is, is expanding. And again, I think that's with increasing work uh, that's been done. Now, one of the things though to keep in mind, um, not all, t you know, we talked about earlier that published data says 90% of TR is functional, but keep in mind not all TR is functional, right? So here, somebody tell me what's the problem. Okay, prolapse of what? Yeah, so tricuspid valve prolapse. So how do you make that diagnosis? What's that? Okay, so yeah, everybody see that? So if you look at this leaflet right here, it's going up above the plane, right? So how much does it need to go up? What's that? Oh. So, so I, I'm asking this to be facetious. So tricuspid, if you go back again and look at the historical literature, tricuspid valve prolapse, there's some case reports. Uh, this is actually a study of 13 patients, New England Journal of Medicine, 1972, right? So we just came a little too late. <laughs> so you, these, these were right ventriculography that they did, and they described tricuspid valve prolapse uh, in this series of patients. And if you look at the literature, what's interesting is there were, in the 70s and early 80s, there were descriptions of tricuspid valve prolapse. And then, it, and then Bob Levine had this very nice paper where he said, you know, for mitral valve prolapse, it's not just seeing any leaflet displacement. You've got to have, understand the anatomy of the annulus and then have kind of a, 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 set, a, a certain amount of displacement before you just call it prolapse. And what's interesting is, you know, after he did this study for def, 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 defining mitral valve prolapse, you see much lower prevalence of mitral valve prolapse because it's properly diagnosed. You see a lack of interest in the tricuspid valve prolapse because there's, no, there's very few studies after that. Up until most recently, there was an echo study from Boston where they uh, looked at tricuspid valve prolapse and proposed an echocardiographic definition. And then there was actually an MRI study also done a couple of years ago where they just kind of use an empiric definition of prolapse. And so one of the questions I think it, we're talking about is there's not a good diagnostic criteria for tricuspid valve prolapse. And so this is actually one of the things that was just published a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, Dr. Andrade Guta here uh, worked on this project to say, let's come up with diagnostic criteria uh, for what do you define as tricuspid prolapse. And so the, the way to do this is to say, let's look at normals, right? And, and, uh, for those of you that sit with me in, in the MRI lab, I frequently have, I like to go back and look at normals, right? Because again, you see an abnormality, you wanna go back and look at normal case and say, is this abnormality really r different than normals? Or is it just that I'm happening to notice it in this case? And so the way that this approach was done is to, to kind of characterize the normal healthy cohorts, uh, define what is a normal tricuspid displacement, and then from that, apply this to set a criteria, or apply these criteria to a, a series of patients with mitral valve prolapse, and also then to a series of patients with non-degenerative 
uh, primary MR. And you know, in the MRI lab, uh, we have two standard views that we do in almost every single patient, the four-chamber view and this RV three-chamber view. So these are the views we focused in on, came up with a set of criteria for which normals do not exceed this, and that was really more than two millimeters for the anterior or posterior leaflet, but more than three millimeters for the septal leaflet. If you remember that earlier slide I showed you, the tricuspid annulus also has high points and low points, right? And so the whole point is if, you're, if you have a view that's going through the low point of the annulus, then you're gonna have some amount of what leaflets coming above what looks like the annular plane, which is just normal. And so that's why there's a slightly different definition for the anterior and posterior leaflets versus the septal leaflets. And using this definition, none of the volunteers met this criteria for prolapse. None of the patients with non-degenerative MR met this criteria for prolapse. But you see, especially in the patients with bileaflet prolapse, Barlow's patients, a much higher prevalence of having tricuspid valve prolapse, suggesting one, that these may be interrelated processes, that there may be a connective tissue disorder that's also affecting the tricuspid valve as well. And then I think what's interesting is if you look at tricuspid valve function, those with tricuspid prolapse had a higher prevalence of having tricuspid regurgitation, significant TR. So again, gets back to the whole issue of you know most TR that you're gonna come across is secondary, but you also need to keep in mind, especially in the setting of mitral valve prolapse, uh, that, that you may also have some associated tricuspid valve prolapse as well, and that can be associated with uh, higher incidence of tricuspid regurgitation. So, Good yep. What's a, there's two different things. You're talking about is the severity of the regurgitation. That's function, right? That's the function of the valve. The other is the anatomic abnormality or the mechanism, right? Because you can see this in, in the mitral valve, right? You could have people with Barlow's and they don't have much mitral regurgitation, right? So, so having uh, mitral valve, pro, having prolapse of a valve doesn't automatically mean there's severe regurgitation. So you need to independently assess both things. You need to assess the mechanism but also assess the function and the severity, okay? So um, I, I wanna stop here, but I think what I wanted to try to touch on is just the fact that there's a lot to the RV we don't know. And I think one of the nice things I think is what you're seeing, in the, especially in this, this last decade, is there's a lot more awareness and a lot more understanding, uh, but there's still much more to be learned. Um, so, but use the principles that you know from the left side, use those to help you look at the right side you know, I think MRI is a great technique because it allows you to get good visualization of the right heart, and I, I suspect we'll be learning more and more things uh, as we go. So I'm gonna pause there. Any other comments or questions? No? All straightforward? <laughs> All right, great, thank you very much. Yep.